We're observing the last Sunday of Advent this morning. We're holding off on Christmas Eve until this afternoon and evening, so while tonight will be all about the baby Jesus, this morning is all about Mary. Today's reading is situated in the middle of Elizabeth and Zechariah's story from last week. After Zechariah received a vision and went mute, Elizabeth conceived and went into seclusion for five months. Then, the same angel appeared directly to Mary, a young bride-to-be. Gabriel tells her not to be afraid that she has found favor with God. She will bear a son named Jesus, and he will be great. Mary asks how this can be since she is a virgin. Notice that just like Zechariah, she asks that quick clarifying question, how? And the angel promises God's action of overshadowing. Or in the Greek, episkadzo. This word is used again later to describe the cloud on the mountain of transfiguration that the cloud of God overshadowed or episkadzoed them and said, this is my son, the beloved. Then the angel tells Mary that her relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son, and Mary hurries across the Judean countryside to Elizabeth's house. Hearing Mary's voice, Elizabeth's unborn child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and tells Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And this is where our reading begins today. The Holy Gospel, according to Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For you, Lord, have looked with favor on your lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. You, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. You have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You have shown strength with your arm and scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of your servant Israel to remember the promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. And Mary remained with her relative Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Speaking of staying with relatives, tis the season. Traveling, gathering, hosting, sharing meals, singing songs, and telling stories. This story of Mary and Elizabeth together just might be the first Christmas celebration. I can imagine the two of them getting together and sharing all kinds of stories, maybe about their experiences with babies on the way, maybe about their husbands, one of whom is mute, the other of whom isn't a husband yet, and maybe about the mothers who came before them. It's not only stories that are shared, but prophecies, too. Elizabeth is, quote, filled with the Holy Spirit. Classic prophecy, if you ask me. She is the first one to prophesy around our story today, and Mary follows suit with that song of praise. Mary's song of praise is energized, animated by the legacies of songs like it that women of the Bible sang before. Think of Miriam's song in Exodus, or Hannah's song in 1 Samuel. 
Aren't songs like these passed down from parent to child, from mother to daughter? In this way, Mary's song of praise is an improvisation on the ancient form of feminine praise, an active and charged praise that moves us into new understanding of God's work in the world. In so much classical theology, Mary has been understood as an empty vessel, as a meek and mild woman who holds her tongue, who doesn't wield any agency. But in fact, Mary has a lot to say. Mary is not passive, as much of this theology, almost all exclusively by men, suggests. In fact, Mary is perhaps one of the most skilled theologians actively interpreting her situation, God's grace is made known to her, meeting her in her lowly position, and Mary sings and interprets and reflects on that stunning grace of God. Her song is prophecy too, because that grace of God will then become incarnate, word made flesh, to live among us. Mary attests in her song that she is lowly, for God has looked with favor on God's lowly servant. That word lowly is the culprit here when it's interpreted as meek or mild or agreeable. But I think it's more about class. Quote, God has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Mary sings that God is lifting her up from a lowly social position and that this is an attribute of God, This is what God does. God is with those who are suffering and those who are struggling with the material realities of their everyday existence, and God's work is to lift them up. We know this about God through Elizabeth's story, too. Elizabeth was old and had no children, and after she becomes pregnant, she says, This is what the Lord has done for me showing me great mercy, lifting the disgrace that I have endured among my people. In both stories, we bear witness to a God who looks with favor on the disgraced, or the lowly. This all has to do with honor and shame. The stories from our scriptures come from an honor and shame society, according to scholars. The ancient Mediterranean civilizations followed honor and shame codes, where one's social value is gathered and defended through things like one's class, size of clan or household, military prestige. All of these bring honor, specifically to the male heads of household. A person's relative honor or shame is based on proximity to that honorable head of house and upon one's adherence to familial norms of the household system. For women like Mary and Elizabeth, this meant, have lots of children, but only once you're married. Of course, scholars talk about honor and shame societies like it's a thing of the past, like this was a part of history that's now sealed away. But could it be that we still carry with us aspects of honor and shame societies? Have you ever felt compelled to do something because of the honor it would bring you. I can't imagine this sort of thing happening today, can you? It becomes the most clear in the next story that we will hear tonight. Mary and Joseph go from door to door, knocking and asking if they can stay. Mary is obviously pregnant, and the two of them are obviously unmarried, which is shameful, a disgraced social position. We tell this story so often like it's the hardness of the shopkeeper's heart to close their door and not let Mary and Joseph stay with them, when in reality these shopkeepers are dutiful rule followers of an honor and shame game that's at play throughout our human history. They are doing exactly what's expected, upholding the honor and shame system, reinscribing the shame placed on Mary and Joseph by closing the door on them, dutifully reproducing the violent norms of their society. Mary and Joseph have shame 
because they have been handed that shame, and because of that shame, they are cast out and left for dead. That is the impact of honor and shame. Honor is the social tool that decides who can come into our lives, who can come into our homes, who can come into our stores, who can come into our churches, who can come into the fold of God as we've decided it. And shame is the social tool that decides who is out, who we ignore, whose cries we do not hear. And God disrupts that shame These two disgraced women prophesy assurance of God's grace against the world's shame. Let me take a moment to summarize. The disgraced are those who are assigned shame and who therefore come to bear it. Before our reading today, Elizabeth called herself disgraced and was brought out of that position by the mercy of God. Mary, too, was lowly, which also means in a state of humiliation, and faces that humiliation head on as she searches for a place to give birth. There is nothing meek or mild here, only tenacious and resilient women forced to bear shame and blessed to bear grace. Whereas the world can dish out shame with heaping helpings, God distributes grace even more freely, especially to those who have been disgraced by the world. This is what God does, scattering the proud, filling the hungry with good things, meeting Mary in her lowly position, lifting Elizabeth out of disgrace. May we, like Mary, sing to that stunning grace of God. May our welcome be that song. May our welcome be wide enough to hold the outcast, the disgraced, the lowly, May we join in the work of God to lift up those pressed down. May the grace of God then become incarnate, word made flesh, to live among us. Amen.